I'm Jim Black and my fellow bookend here is Brian Curry. And you might imagine the compliments are flying already. Now Jim Black was chief sports writer of the Scottish Sun for more years than you could shake a stick at. And he was celebrated for his inquiring mind. Now, inquiring minds are not exactly welcomed in the secret society that is Scottish football. Thus, he reached up the noses of the fairest quicker than a line of white mischief. His disputes with Jock Steen, Alec Ferguson, and would you believe Jim McLean are the stuff of tabloid legend. And yet, the flip side of Jim is that he had a warm friendship with the late and great Jim Baxter. Listeners to Radio Scotland will recognise Jim's dulcet tones and book enthusiasts will be familiar with his best-selling works on Billy McNeil and John Gray. Brian, meanwhile, has had a roller coaster career and it might be argued a highly controversial one. Whilst working for the Scottish Sun in the 70s, he got so buried on a trip with the Scotland team to Spain that he was declared dead by the team doctor. <laughs> When the diagnosis, as you can see, proved faulty, Cooney was then banned by the SFA. <laughs> he resurrected himself from the shame of it all to become a columnist on the Daily Star and ultimately head of sport of the Daily Mail in London. Now he writes for the Sunday Herald and broadcasts for Radio Scotland. He's also noted for finding the elusive George Connolly and sitting him down long enough to write his autobiography. But that's enough of our DNA. It's time to introduce the star of the show, the man who insists on keeping one foot, at least, in the rave. He was born in Bells Hill, overcame that hurdle, and set out on a football career with Celtic, before finding a more natural habitat in Greenock. He played 213 times in seven years at Capelo, scoring 100 goals. He scored from the corner flag, he scored from the halfway line, and some say he scored in his Norris front parlour. <laughs> he was a genius with a maverick tendency. Ladies and gentlemen, please make your hands raw with applause for the inimitable, the one and only, Andy Ritchie. Yeah! faces 
Uh, they were appearing on television, sweet at that time, with makeup on, and it was a big thing. And we ended up back at this party on a Sunday night after an afternoon in Hasty's Farm in Burnbank. And Brian decided that it might be a good idea to see how I looked with mascara and lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> and they uh, went to bed and had to travel back into Celtic Park again on Monday morning for training. And you should have seen me trying to get that makeup off at <laughs> 20 past 7 in the Monday morning before I went into Big Joe. <laughs> Still bits of the mascara sticking in. The woman will remember that wee bit sticking in the corner, you know, from a, from a weird and wonderful evening the night before. Andy, would he have been the personality he was, the musician he was, if he hadn't had that kind of mad streak that you alluded to? Ah, he did. He, very much so. You know, he had a very humble background by him, you know. I mean, he was actually half brother at Mark uh, McManus, uh, Taggart, detective, and uh, he came from a humble background in Bum Mike. Some days he would turn up at Hasty's farm and he'd just wander in through the door as if there was nobody. And, the next week he would decide that he wanted to come in show for Rhythm in a Rolls Royce. Yeah, they were number one in the charts at that time and everything was going for him. But he was eccentric, yeah, but very shy at the same time as well. You know? He quite enjoyed the spell that he had around these young people out there in Hamilton. He was still able to go and, and, and do what was basically a, a rock star's job at that moment in time. You know? How long did it take Big Job to forgive you and, and stop digging you up a bit of makeup? Eh, uh, it, it took him about four years to forget about that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the first few boys following me about, they quite fancy you, by the way. You like to name them? Say, Dixie Deans. We go with Lex, we go with that was great, and I could sing at the same time, so, you know, I had two things going for me for Bobby. Let's go back a little bit, even there. Um, you went to school. And your assistant headmaster, I think, was, was Craig Brown. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about the, the, the Craig Brown in the early years. The... Yeah, well, that would be the last year of primary school when Craig had unfortunately had to give up the game. Well, I don't know if it was ever in the frigging game anyway. <laughs> 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 Sorry, and he, he, had, he had went through his teacher training course at, I think, at Craigie College at that time, and his first post. He was, he was given the assistant head post at Belvedere Primary in Bells Hill and uh, I happened to be there in the last year and uh, I can't really, really remember whether it was enjoyable or not. I remember things happening like, you know, after school classes where you used to just go and play football. All of a sudden they were taken out with the blackboard and the chalk and the tactics and everything else. And, That's the tension, <laughs> I could be something after 24, so at 11 it just went straight out. <laughs> Uh, I remember half an hour sessions on that, and the only person that really knew what was going on in the classroom, well, if we did, was Craig Brown. And normally, we're only a tiny wee school in Bill Silver, you know, maybe 60 or 70 pupils. And inevitably, we'd be at 11 1 some of the big schools, taking it to start all over again, you know. So the dark so secrets. would get rubbed off the board and be back to plan B again, you know. So the dark secrets are coming out of Craig Brown the early years. Yeah, yeah. He didn't have much success at Belvedere, did not he? Well, he didn't have much success at Pride, anyway. And Scotland's debatable, isn't it? <laughs> so, can we assume, Andy, at this point, you didn't see a future Scotland manager teaching you? No, and he certainly didn't see a future football player when he was there. <laughs> I would be surprised to see I was the biggest boy in the class. But uh, anybody that knows anything at all about my family would say that that's par for the course, you know. We're we're not any shrinking violets by any man, I mean, we're all, we're all big people. Yeah, I was the biggest boy in the class, I could kick the ball for this. Craig Brown didn't see much of that, you know, he wanted uh, uh, a wee bit more technical than that. Technical was a word that came out later on, right enough, you know, he just thought it was hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> most, most kids try to, um, whatever the sport or, or profession, try to hide their light under a bushel. What, what kind of age did you realise that you had something special about you? Uh, probably about 14. Uh, there was a lot of, at that time in the area. <coughs> Most of the English clubs were coming up in big English clubs and playing trial matches. And what they did was they took over the junior stadium and they, they, they organised through their scouts here for maybe 20 or 30 or 40 sometimes kids to come along and, and play in trial games. And, uh, <coughs> I'd been playing with Elsa OIM for about a year before that, and uh, <laughs> I forgot to write it, you know. <laughs> so, 
I didn't really have any great aspirations of having a football career. Some of the guys that were at school at the same time as me, they, they were getting contracts with Arsenal and West Brom and different things like that. But I hadn't even had an invite, so I couldn't really say that, you know, that it was ever in the back of my mind. But I remember when I was about 14, eh, Middlesbrough had a trial at Cumberland Hall Juniors. And two of the guys, it was a miserable day, I'll never forget it. Two of the guys never turned up. And uh, the guy who was organising it, and you and my father, and phoned them and said, you couldn't get big handy to come along, could you? Make up the numbers. <laughs> and uh, I said no. <laughs> and a quick clip in the ear, my dad says aye. And uh, I went to come on all day, turned up, started the game. Obvious. I thought I did well enough in the game. And I scored the goal. And about two minutes after I scored the goal, a bit like later on in my career at Capital, the board came up. <laughs> and Big Andy was off. And it was all 25 minutes into the game. And I remember Harold Shepherdson, who was Sir Alf Ramsey's assistant manager in England's World Cup 66 squad. He was there, he was assistant manager at Middlesbrough, with Stan Anderson, the manager. I remember looking at him on the way off and he just gave me a wee smile, you know. He says, you maybe go back on later on, but we're not sure, you know, the old, the, the elbow routine. And uh, I didn't go back on again. And it was after the game, somebody came forward and asked me if I'd like to go and through the back and speak to Harold Shepherds and Stan Anderson. And they offered me the opportunity to come down and trial for a week at Middlesbrough, which I totally and completely. I was banjacked through the whole thing. Uh, I was only 14 and didn't really think about it. And I couldn't wait to get him to tell my man and my dad. You know, all of a sudden, I was doing something important. And by the time I'd got to the car, the gentleman had driven me up, I did five, six different offers of the opportunity to go to football clubs. Uh, Manchester United, Coventry, Arsenal, Celtic. And by the time I got home, the Ranger Scout was sitting in my mother's city by the time I got back home. <laughs> so within the space of travel on that Sunday, to come on home and coming back, well, you can never say my career had started at that time. Was, was the flamboyant Andy Ritchie, we later saw Andy in your career at Celtic and Morton, in particular Morton, was it there then when you were a youngster? No. I was a very quiet, shy boy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that uh, it took a while for that to develop, you know. At least something the life it takes. You know, at 14 I was I was just an ordinary kid. I just wanted to try and do my best uh, and then try and make a career for myself and, and basically try and make my parents happy. That's that that was what that was all about, you know. My dad was a, a labourer on the Rolls Royce, he actually labored to and Jimmy Holmes, who was a modern fullback. Jimmy was an engineer up in the Rolls Royce. But that was a quite humble man. You know, he, this was all too much for him, you know, the eh, traversing to Celtic Park and to speak to Sean Fallon and Jock Steen. And I remember Sean Fallon, the first time I went in to see him at Celtic Park because my dad had dropped me in. Sean Fallon went in his back pocket, took a bundle of money out, pulled out a 50 pound note. Gave it to my dad for his expenses, you know, that will cover from your day off work to bring the boy in. My dad was only earning 18 pounds a week, you know. This is phenomenal. He thought, Christ, I could get this every week out of the day. But, uh, we come back down the road again and, 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 and maybe we couldn't get change to get the bus back out again for Celtic Park. You know? <laughs> Think on the bus for a 50 pound note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, running a bit daft trying to find a bag at the top of Celtic Park to, to, to take stuff in with. Uh, so we never really thought, my mother and father did the, did the bit when we were about clubs down in England and they were, they were treated very graciously at Manchester United because Sir Matt Busby at that time was, uh, was the main man at Manchester and I had been a paper boy, we believe, many years before that, and I delivered the papers to Sir Matt Smuller, Mrs. Murphy, and Bill Sill. We were both Bill Sill people. My dad knew his brother, Jimmy, and uh, Manchester United looked after us really well and were very kind. In fact, Sir Matt Busby had even got the late great George Best to come out and pick me up and take me to the cliff to train in the mornings. 
Hattie, where are you all right enough because you was all the time. And your brother was reading with Dewey's half the time with the end that he tried to argue. But at 14, you know, my mother and father were director of box seats for the Liverpool Everton semi final in the Cup of 1970 at Old Trafford. My dad never ever forgot that. Never ever forgot that. So, what were you like in George Best Company at that time? Were you just totally overawed? Or? Eh, well, I suppose he was, you know, it was like, I've never been in any type of jagged before. <laughs> <laughs> I think at, at that, everything's new, so there's yeah. nothing you can gauge upon it. You, nothing like that happens, you know. Mm -hmm. One week you're in school at the Bellstar Academy, and the next week you're sitting in any type of jagged with George Best making a little conversation to you, you know, because he's been told to bring you in. But the, the whole thing, the whole context here, there's, there's no lead into that. All of a sudden you're plucked from one set of yeah. circumstances to the other. Uh, there's nothing to set you up. And at that age, you, you, it's basically just a new experience. So what was your first conscious memory of, of Jock Steen? Uh, the, the night I signed as an S for him at Celtic Park. It was the first time I basically shook hands with Mr. Steen at that time. You know? I'd seen him wandering about. He was always there. Yeah, I was, at that time I was training with Celtic on a Tuesday night and then going to Ibrox on a Thursday night to train. Yeah, and that wasn't a problem for me because, well, it would, it would have been a problem with being a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'd, I'd seen him wandering around, but he always seemed to be there on a Tuesday night with Wally Fermi, the great Wally Fermi said he was looking after the boys at that time and the kids on a Tuesday night. And, and, and Big Jock was always there, but he never took anything. He was just there. And the first time they ever spoke directly to me was, was the night that I signed as a, an S4 in the Celtic Park. And uh, that, that's, you know, that was everything. I had, signed, I had signed two weeks after Celtic had been beaten in the 1970 European Cup final. So the place obviously was in the best of moods at that time. But at the same time, we took time out to, to spend time and to. He was very gracious. My dad obviously was very gracious at that time. Was, was he, was he Andy, the, the big, warm, cuddly guy that Brian and I missed? <laughs> <laughs> nah. I, I suppose it's like everything. It, 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 it was very much... He did that because I was 14 at that time. My relationship with Big Joe really deteriorated after his accident. Yeah, the terrible car smashing. Before that, I had seen TV Flavour of the Month with him. I had made the first team debut at 17. I was involved in most things at Celtic Park that was happening. Uh, taking me off the ground staff, I'd gone to play as a junior at Kirkintal Prob Roy. And basically people at that time stayed for a couple of years at junior clubs when were found out. I was 16. I was going to play amongst men. And uh, he took a personal interest, I remember. <clears throat> My first game for Kirkintel Rob Roy it was a local derby against Kilsyth Rangers. <coughs> I was straight from an under-16 boys club in the summertime to, to the August playing in that game. And I, I could always, I remember feeling a buzz about the ground when I was out, felt like Paul next day. There was a buzz about the place. <laughs> uh, and I didn't really understand why that was, but five months after the game had started, Chuck Steen and Sean Fallon were there at the game. He came out to see how I was going to do in my, my first game for Rob Roy against Kilsyth. And I, as I say, I didn't know until half time. By half time, I got myself a hat trick and I ended up scoring five in my first game for, for Kirkland Hall for Rob Roy. And he always kept an interest in it. As you know, Jim, for your years of working, we used to have the old green citizen in the Pink Times. Shows you how old I am. And uh, he read them. You know the things he read on the bus travelling back to Celtic games? He read everything from front to back. He knew everything about everybody and he knew results and scores. So on a Monday morning he could more or less converse with anybody in, in, in football in regards to how they had done and how their team had done. Was that was when you had the conversation, Andy, was that after he'd phoned the son in the record and expressed the ball to the journalist and the other end of the phone? <laughs> well, that was that. that and it used to be a great way of only inviting his friends in, the journalists, as you well know, on a Sunday morning. I was on the ground staff at that time, so we used to have to come in and tidy up Celtic Park. And, you know, there'd only be those and such as those that were there on a Sunday morning. 
You know, everybody else. We were all stars. Yeah. I don't remember seeing the team. <laughs> I think I was there twice. <laughs> when did you get your first ball came from Steve? Uh, probably about 74. <laughs> uh, well, I, I wasn't too happy with the way I was behaving at that time. You know, I, and how were you behaving? We used to have, the old days when everybody took drinking in the Celtic Park, we took the bottles of McEwen's Pale Ale and everything else. And our job on a Monday morning was to clean the terraces up. And, uh, we used to have to brush them from top to bottom, take all the stuff down. And, as you can well imagine, the McEwen's Pale Ale was well out of it by that time, and there seemed to be a yellow liquid that's coming down the side And uh, I used to have a bit of a carry on, sometimes, you know. The, the noise from inside with the brush and taking all the bottles and cans down, people can hear. So I'd lob a couple of bottles and smash them around about people's feet. It's a bit of pish and a bit of ankle, does not it? <laughs> <laughs> and this day I managed to throw one at the Rangers end. And I would be surprised to say there had been a few bottles thrown at the Rangers end previous to that. <laughs> and it hit a barrier and smacked Tommy Burns right in between the eyes. <laughs> nice as you like. We'd take him into Bob Rooney and get his nose sucked. His nose was broken. He was broken for the rest of his life after that. And uh, that was the first one ball up and I got up and joke. I'd do one up to it. There was only four years in the terrace and then the rest of the boys like it get. So I'd do one up to it. So, 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 take us, I mean, we all know or we hear about Alex Ferguson's hair dryer. What was the steam hair dryer like? Uh, it was frightening. Absolutely frightening. Uh, I remember the first time I seen it was in a reserve game at Ibrox in a League Cup game. There were 23,000 people at the, at the reserve game at Ibrox. Colin Steen was playing, I believe, that night. That shows you how long ago it was. And uh, Celtic had a good team, a lot of good players. Yeah. Uh, we were down 4 0, would you believe, at half time. And that was the first time I ever witnessed it in full flow. And, uh, yeah, that was enough to... Well, it would be surprised to see a pair of brown corns would have been the norm. <laughs> but he was in full flow. He, he was majestic when it came to doing that. And he, he was clearly, unquestionably, a truly great manager. He don't win European Cups and nine titles and all the rest of it without being a great manager. How much of his success came from the fear factor from the intimidation, from the terror of your life. Or has that been unfair? No, it's, I don't think it's been unfair. It would be suffice to say, looking back on it now, that, you know, Big Jock was a bully. I need to realize about it. You know, I was lucky enough to be able to get as a young guy, but, you know, I was in around about guys who had been through it all through the, through the mid 60s, who had come into the place. And, that's it, it would be suffice to say they were, they were terrified from him at times. He controlled every aspect of their life. You know, Jimmy Johnson, who, who lived not too far from me and who I knew all his life, was, was terrified of the big job. You know, now, there wasn't a fullback in the world, there wasn't a defender in the world that Jimmy was feared. There wasn't anything else in the world. He wasn't feared the big Aggie in his life, and I wouldn't be feared for Aggie. <laughs> but, uh, Jimmy just wasn't feared of anybody, but he, he was feared of the big job. So it might, it might be easier asking instead of going to who, who uh, was scared of him, who wasn't scared of him? Uh, see what I think about Bobby Murdoch was probably the only one I remember. Jim Brogan, to a certain extent. Uh, Jim Brogan was a self-made millionaire when a million was worth a lot of money. Uh, Jim had businesses and all and, 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 and Jim was a, was a type of fella who didn't they react? But a bit like myself, didn't they react very well to bullies? Uh, but I would say I was young at that time, but I remember Jim being able to stand up for, him, for himself there. But I don't really remember many others doing that. You know, we Bertie occasionally would say something out of his mouth, but it was always well out with the vicinity where I'd go to here. <laughs> 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 To, to look at that, not only did he, did he frighten them, I mean two ways about that, he did frighten them, but they had the utmost respect for him. You know, he could see things around like that when he walked into 
His presence in the place was, was overpowering at times. Uh, and the players responded to that as well. You've got to have that. See, yes. if you don't have that, you ain't a football manager. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. You know, laughing and joking was a place for it. But as soon as the, the business had to be done, big joke, he could, he could get it done. And the, Sir Alex is often, well, I mean, big joke was Sir Alex. Here of your life, he's, he's role model as a manager, worked very closely. And, and as much as you know, uh, Alex Ferguson was something like that. Well, <clears throat> what comparisons do you think you would draw with the, with the two? Very, very similar. Very similar. Uh, probably, probably Alec Ferguson's got a lot more personality than Big Joe Cut. Uh, I know that's hard to believe. Big Joe was totally, completely one dimensional. You know, Alex's not like that. Alex can cover himself in any company at all. And, you know, he moves within the racing circles to the football circles as if they don't, as if there's no gap there at all. He, he is more gracious and in times like that, whereas Big Joe was totally completely focused on his football team and his football players. Alex liked that, but at the same time, socially, there is no better company than Alex Ferguson socially. He does hold court, mm. but he's got plenty to say and he doesn't mind sharing that way. Big Joe was a bit of a closed book when it came to that. Yeah. And also as well, Big Joke didn't take a drink. You know, and a wise man once said to me once, don't trust anybody in fact that doesn't take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> he was always watching, whereas Alec likes to have a few bottles of beer and he does enjoy a glass of wine from time to time. And socially, he's very good company, which is exact opposite. But it was, it was Big Joke upset, I think, you know, my own experience was that Big Joke became obsession with the drink, you know. If anybody took a drink tonight, it was always, he would dig the press up for taking a drink. But I was fairly unknown for the press to take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> do, you think, do you think it was part of it was an act about the drink thing, Andy? No, I think thing. you really, you really believe that. You know? But he had, he had <clears throat> within his own squad of players, within uh, the players that were there at that time. You know, we, we, these boys were quite partial to him, you know, they didn't oh, shy so, over it. And there were some very good operators. And we, we, we lived in those days for, like, for, for the younger people in the audience. We lived in those days where we used to get thrown to pubs at half past two and left them in. And uh, I remember being at Park Head one day and we went to a place called the Duke of Train, just at the top of Park Head Cross, the restaurant and the, with a drink. And Rod Stewart joined the group that day to have a drink at the top end of the, the road. And, and Big Joke found out about it. So Rod was in and he was ordering drinks for people. And was, Plenty going on round about door burst open. Big fella came in, you know. And there's Dixie trying to explain to him, Rod Stewart, you know, we'd probably take Rod out and give him a drink and a bite of lunch and what have you. And he cleared the whole place, he cleared the whole restaurant and bar, all the Celtic players, and cleared Rod Stewart out. He <laughs> 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 had a little boys meeting, and he was taking me to Glasgow Airport to fly down to Newcastle for a concert that night. And he's probably at the concert two hours earlier than he should have been. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it was, he knew where people were. He could tell you where you were on the Monday morning. Something that could be okay. It was always nice to know that somebody knew where I was in. <laughs> in spite of all the respect and the whatever you, you showed for him, there was a part in the ways and it, it wasn't all that uh, happy or... Well, it wasn't. It? By, the, by the time he had been away for about a year to 15 months after his accident with the car, and Sean had been in charge of the, the team and the club at that time, and, and you know what Sean Fallon knew about that, where you could put in the back of a postie stamp with a felt tip marker. <laughs> so, you know, my career had went from being part of the 18 and the first team at that time, and big job in his accident to coming back, but he would have needed radar to find me. <laughs> Uh, he was concerned about it, he was upset about it, and I had developed a relationship with Sean that wasn't particularly good at that time. <clears throat> and I went from, as I say, being first team to not even being able to get a game in the reserve team. So when he came back, he was unsure about it. But he came back not the same man as he had left, you know, the, the accident, the, the car crash had taken its toll terribly on him physically. 
and he was trying to fight his own way back and everything in life saw about timing. And I believe at that time, if that hadn't happened and we continued down the road we were going, my career was in an up, upward slope. By the time he had got back in, my career was too far down the road and he really didn't have me or the inclination or the strength at that time to, to, to do as much as he possibly could for me. He did, however, Andy, before you came to Mark, he did make an attempt to keep you at Celtic Park. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it actually, I hadn't been playing with the reserve team and I'd went to see him in the office this day, and, you know, and I chapped the door. At that time, Celtic Park wasn't the same animal as it is now, where there's 400 people working in it and there's 50 offices and, uh, you know, there's alleyways leading down, and there's like, you know, tap in, there's propaganda alleyway leading down there, and, uh, other ones round about, you know, that, that you would say to yourself, well, there's, there's a million people working in here. Uh, there was only four or five people working at Celtic Park. My wee was his secretary, and I tapped the door that day. I'm going in to see him, and I remember him. You know, was, he always greeted you with a, ah! You know, that was it. No matter what it was, you know, you could go in there telling him you to spot the ball, and you could go in there asking for a rise. He treated you the same way. Ah! And he said to me that day that he, you know, if I wanted to play, I might need to go on loan and have a few games on loan. And, and that was the first time he'd ever mentioned to me the fact that I might be able to come to Morton and, 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 and play on loan. Yeah. And I, I remember thinking at that time that was a, a real good idea because I'd been playing in the reserves at that time. and. Yeah, I'd been a Mullerwell supporter as a boy. My dad dragged me a line to Mullerwell. I'd been brought up with the Mullerwell teams of the 60s and early 70s. And there was a guy called Johnny Goldthorpe. He used to play for Mullerwell. And at that time, he was the centre forward for Morton. In fact, that looks a bit like him there. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually put a bit of weight on there. He got an erection. And Big Gold was there at that time. And I remember thinking, he was my hero at Mullerwell. And I remember thinking that would be great to go down to Morton, wherever that is, <laughs> and play with Johnny Goldthorpe on loan for a few months and see if I could maybe get some games under my belt eh, and play a wee bit more regular. That's how it came round about at the start. And Mr. Steve, at the end of it, he eh, wish you well. No, he didn't, because at that time, he came back to me again and said to me that the deal was done and would I like to go out there, I to sign Roy Baines at that time and, you know, I could be used as a wee bit of a featherweight in it and, uh, and would, would I be prepared to go complete? Uh, I wasn't at the time, but when we eventually did. I agreed in a horrible wee cafe, a wee greasy spoon cafe with the late great Hal Stewart. Uh, a deal to go to Morton with my wife kicking me under the table and saying, you must be happy to read. This guy's a fucking crook. <laughs> Any man that can sit in Joe's kitchen with a soft hat on like Bob Pope is going to be a crook. I looked like somebody would sell, you know, second-hand motors to you when you didn't really want one. Uh, when I come back to Celtic Park at that time, I get called in and Big Joke offered me a new four-year contract. He said to me, you, you don't really want to be going there with her. So I won't forget it. And I said, no, no, I, I quite like the idea of going to play in there and maybe resurrect a career and score a few goals and hopefully do well for myself and do well for Morton. But we'll see what happens. I certainly, Jim, I certainly didn't go for the money. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, are you right? <laughs> I think you were telling me previously, Andy, that when you were at Celtic, you were earning £45 a week basic. And at Morton you were on, what was it, 20? 28. 28 pounds a week. So you, had, you obviously had to play and get win bonuses to get yeah. anything close to what you were getting yourself at that. Yeah. Well, that time, as I say, 45 quid, you know, was, was the basic itself. Oh, so 28 quid, and I think it was 10 pounds a point at Morton. Which is something that I say you were, you were grossly overpaid. <laughs> 10 pound a point, Jim, so in any of these mathematics, I was actually getting more money at Morton than I was at Celtic. Yeah. But the unfortunate thing was that we had to knock down 11 opposition players every week and beat them. Slightly more difficult. Qualify for it, which was slightly more difficult. Yeah. What, what, was there something, Andy, was, was there a, 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 a audience will react to this comment, but was there 
a sense of a romanticism almost of it coming to more a small, much smaller problem in an, an area that you weren't familiar with. Well, certainly an area I wasn't familiar with, you know. The freaking motorway wasn't even built at that time. <laughs> it was a three day pony trek. <laughs> to Alaska by the time we didn't know it. It was a Wednesday night came, it was raining, it was miserable, it was Clyde Bank. It always seemed to be frigging Clyde Bank. <laughs> Katie Cooper was playing that night for, for Clyde Bank. And, uh, I remember thinking when I walked into the place, oh, I went into the dressing room through the back and there was an enormous great big gas fire in the dressing room. But something had to connect it all down. <laughs> and you knew right away when you walk in, you know it's... He's thinking the gas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was the the book, half the sleeve like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm walking down the corridor when I met Big John Goldthorpe. Now, Big John Goldthorpe was a perfect gentleman, still is to this day. And he meets me in the corridor, and I've met him through a mutual friend, as I say, before him. He recognised me. Well, he did. He had a green head and bone jacket on, you know. I think he was looking like a Celtic badge on it when I walked in. He says, how are you doing? I says, I'm fine, John, how are you doing? I'm great, what are you up to? I says, I'm down, I'm playing tonight. He says, all oh, right. He says, what are you doing in loan? Because there must have been something in the paper. I says, no, Goldie, I signed this afternoon. He says, what the fuck do you mind to do that for? <laughs> <laughs> The only way is up here, Jim. I don't know much I don't know much I can achieve now and that's the start of it. I mean we, you obviously you came under Al's influence. He was a somewhat different character from Big Jock in many ways. Um, I mean more than I think at that time there was a bit of fun attached to the club, wasn't there as well? There was a, there was a kind of a more relaxed atmosphere, shall we say. Yeah. Right. And there was a well, we had changed over very quickly. But I think it lasted we went out doing it about six weeks where there was a group of players, there was guys like Jimmy Townsend and Ian Snedden and one or two older players, John Watson, oh, who had been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they were changing the club over. Benny had been in. And Benny was, was instrumental in me getting down there to, to Capo as well. Uh, my girlfriend at that time, she, had, she worked in Canvas Line. We used to drop her off every morning. And Benny's wife had a hairdresser down the stairs for their shop. So I used to see him every morning as well. And he used to talk to me about Morton. And I knew Benny through his father Bob, who was a, a physiotherapist at Celtic at that time. And uh, Benny was a bright, new, breath of fresh air, young manager. And, uh, and I liked him. And that's always been very important in my life. I've got to, I seem to have to need to like the people that I either work with or work for. And uh, I did for, with Benny at that time. Morton was third bottom of the league. Uh, we had gone to, I'll never forget, I joined in November and we went to Montrose at Christmas time. And I'd been in many trips with Celtic, European Cup trips, and trips to Scotland and the youth team and everything else. But 